the changing nature of work is a complicated topic. When think tanks and consulting companies cover it, they often focus on education, skills, and training. How do we know what skills we're going to need in the future, and how do we prepare our workforce to get those skills? This is certainly important. We're going to cover that today on this panel, but there are other societal implications as well about how work is changing. It's not just the type of work that's changing, but the form of work as well. If more and more of our workforce are going to be self-employed, if there are going to be fewer and fewer full-time jobs, what are the implications for the safety net we provide for our workforce? If workers need to change jobs more frequently and there's more of the messy middle that the PPF has been focusing on, uh, what does that mean for the employment support system? Are we ready to face that challenge? In Canada, a lot of what I've highlighted falls on the provinces. Obviously education, but also labor standards and the workforce development system itself. This panel should be well placed to discuss these issues. Uh, amid the proliferation of future of work uh, um, symposiums and, and institutes, uh, for my money, uh, the Aspen Institute has done a fantastic job of including all of the different societal implications in their work. One report in particular, an agenda for the US states, helped frame our discussion here today. Ethan Pollack is here from the Aspen Institute. Ethan is Associate Director, Research and Policy for Aspen's Future of Work Initiative. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, in Canada, innovation must come from the provinces given their uh, proximity to labor markets uh, and, the juris and our jurisdictional challenges here in Canada. Fortunately, we're beginning to see some policy experimentation. We're lucky to have Francois Montmini Muni. Oh, uh, you know, we talked about this in the green room. I nailed it in the green room <laughs> and then completely blew it up up here. Francois Montmini Mouillard. C'est un nom difficile, uh, bravo. Uh, to discuss how they're approaching these issues in Quebec and some of the jurisdictional issues you face in trying to solve them. Francois is Director of Intergovernment Relations in the Ministry of Work, Jobs and Social Security of the Gouvernement de Quebec. Uh, bienvenue, Francois. Uh, Francois will be speaking in French today. Julie, I think, is somewhere and will be translating uh, for Francois. We're also joined by two of the most knowledgeable Canadians on this topic, uh, Sarah Doyle, who's Director of Policy and Research at the Brookfield Institute for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, and Sunil Johal, uh, who is currently Director at the Mowat Center for at least a few more days. Three days. Three days. Yeah. And then you start your new job as, I think, Kawhi Leonard's personal assistant. Yep. So thank you for that. Uh, and I hope that's a long, a long job. Um, both Sunil and Sarah have served in government and written extensively on public policy topics, including this one. So first, let's talk about the social safety net. And Ethan, I'd like to start with you. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the future of work conversations tend to be about skills and training. In your state agenda, you spent the first half of it talking about the social safety net and how it needs to be reformed. Can you talk a little bit about why you chose to emphasize that so much in your report? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, <clears throat> the, the, this conversation around the future of work, I think, means so many different things to so many different people. So one of the things we really just tried to do is define what do we actually mean, what are the relevant trends, and, and what are the actual problems that we're trying to solve. And one of the through lines that we see throughout a lot of the different challenges is that there's a changing relationship between businesses and workers. And in particular, that you know, a variety of trends, including uh, you know, financial um, market pressures and global global competition uh, in technology um, are changing how businesses view uh, employment and how they want to relate to workers. Um, and increasingly seeing workers a little less as a, a, a valuable asset, maybe a little more as a cost to be cut. And so you're seeing you know, certainly the, the historical relationship um, of employment in the US and I think in, in Canada as well um, is one where um, <clears throat> the where the employer provided both security and opportunity to the worker, security in the form of, of benefits and rising wages, and opportunity in the form of uh, skills training and also uh, career pathways. And so as we see, you know, kind of over time, we're seeing um, you know, wages stagnate. We're seeing benefits um, for, you know, even for full-time workers. <clears throat> um, you know, the provision of benefits is, is, is falling in the US. Um, and, and then we're also seeing uh, what appears to be the, the data is not perfect, but also skills training declining. Um, so we really think that it's important, certainly, to have you know, in an increasingly automated economy, to have um, more and more opportunities for skills training, but also that we need to really modernize the, 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 um, the social safety net to make sure that it's one that is not necessarily designed around the employer, um, but rather designed around the worker itself. And that's why we 
we've done a lot of work on things like portable benefits, which we define as benefits that are, you know, the, the, that are both portable and also prorated. Uh, so portable in that workers can take the benefit from job to job, from employer to employer, uh, prorated in that if they ha have a bunch of different jobs, then the contributions that those jobs are making to the benefits are proportional to the amount of time that they're working, uh, and universal in the sense that those benefits are accessible not just to full-time or even part-time uh, you know, you know, traditional employees, but also to independent contractors, temp workers, et cetera. Uh, and this is in increasingly important, especially in the age where we're seeing a lot of outsourcing, a lot of temp work. Uh, there's a recent uh, New York Times uh, article about uh, Google, uh, how it, they have now, their, their amount of contractors has, and, and temp workers has exceeded their amount of full-time workers. Uh, so this is, a, this is a, a model that businesses are increasingly trying to employ. Uh, Uber and Lyft are kind of the most high profile and most extreme examples of that, where they're trying to not be an employer at all. But, um, but there's many, many companies that uh, are just trying to kind of get out of that game a little bit more as well. So um, the redesigning kind of the, the, the social safety net so that it is more worker-centric um, I think is a really important component of the future of work. I just, I'm going to stay with you for a minute here, because uh, um, if I think Jim were up here, he would probably be yelling right now uh, and saying that it, sh it shouldn't be about redesigning the safety net, it should be about regulations for companies. Um, has that entered into your work at all, and do you guys have a view on, on that? It's a good question. Um, yes, I, I actually think that there's a, um, you can do all of the above. Um, I'm not against regulations. I think that um, the, I, I would say that I think that there's a bit of a danger in just trying to be where your only strategy is going back to the model um, that, that we used to have and one that was more voluntary and instead try to make it mandatory. Um, I don't think that that, I, I think that that may not succeed. I don't, say, I don't think that we shouldn't try, but just that we should also be trying to create a system that is more designed around workers and one that potentially is, I think, a little more designed for the direction that the economy is, is, is headed. I would also say that these types of systems, portal benefit systems, there's, there's a variety of different bills in different states that would kind of really kind of create, you know, so uh, in Washington state, um, they're, they're, they're pushing a bill that where the, this is mainly focused on kind of the, the Uber and Lyfts of the world, but that they would contribute 25% uh, um, basically a 25% surtax contribution to a worker benefit fund. Mm -hmm. So you can have uh, employers that are still contributing to their worker benefits, um, but not necessarily the, the, the employers control the benefits themselves. Right. Right. So Neil, I'm going to move to you now. There's obvious differences between the US and Canada when it comes to the social safety net. We, I think, can be a bit self-satisfied up here uh, in, in, in that comparison. You've written a lot about this. How big of an issue is this up in Canada? Can you talk about some of the policy issues that you would approach if you were going to make our system more robust? Sure. I mean, I think a lot of it builds on what Ethan was speaking about. But I mean, if, first point is, I mean, all these conversations, all these conferences, we always talk about the future of work. My uh, preoccupation would be, let's focus on the present day of work. We don't need to worry about what's going to happen in five or 10 years. We know there are significant gaps in the social safety net or social architecture uh, currently. So I mean, 6 million Canadians don't visit the dentist because they can't afford to every year. Wage stagnation is a huge issue. If you're a non-management, non-professional employee in Ontario, you've seen zero wage growth adjusted for inflation over the past 20 years. Um, only one in four kids under the age of five have access to regulated childcare space. I mean, I could go on for 40 minutes with these kinds of Please do. statistics. That'll so if everybody's interested, I'll, just, I'll be in the green room <laughs> listing off those statistics for the rest of the day. Um, but I mean, the point is we need to start thinking about those issues and how we fill those gaps and bridge those concerns. And in terms of what policy areas are uh, of interest, I mean, skills training gets a lot of the focus in these conversations because I think it's viewed as kind of the inoculation against disruption. So as industries change, we can take the 45-year-old bus driver and convert him into uh, a, 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 in, convert scientist. him into a scientist or whatever, whatever, whatever other role uh, we focus on. But I mean, fundamentally, what, why do people work? Most of them work to live. So how do we make people's lives easier? And that comes back to things like pensions, healthcare, so access to pharmacare, access to mental health services, 
particularly if we're entering a world where there's more disruption, more turnover, we can expect there'll be more anxiety, more mental health issues, uh, stress, et cetera. It's affordable housing, it's childcare. Cities like Toronto, Vancouver get more unaffordable. How do we expect people making minimum wage or just above that to live in these cities and provide key services that we all uh, rely on? So I don't think it's just skills training. It's everything that government and uh, private industry also should be concerned about. And we should really think about look at the citizen, look at the person, what do they need support in? They're probably going to need support in all of those different areas, access to easier childcare, housing, retirement savings. Uh, so that's why I think this is a bit of a daunting challenge because to me, the, the best answer and the solutions don't lie in a simple, well, if we get skills training right, we're okay. Because we could get, have the best skills training programs in the world, but guess what? A lot of people in society still aren't going to be able to earn enough to make ends meet. So how do we defray those costs through public provision of services, universal programs, or private sector stepping in in some cases as well? So hopefully we can dig into some of that later too. Thanks, Anil. And, and Francois, you're tasked with what, see, with, which, with what seems like a very daunting challenge. Can you tell us about how you're approaching this in Quebec? Are these the issues, when you talk about future of work uh, internally, are these the issues that you're facing and what challenges are you facing in trying to face them? Euh, bien, euh, je vais y aller en français et je vais euh, interrompre de temps en temps pour laisser euh, la traduction euh, s'effectuer. Mais effectivement, des, on partage la lecture là, de, 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 de nos collègues Ethan et, et Sunil euh, et, les, et des impacts euh, au niveau de la main d'œuvre, mais pas seulement au niveau de la main d'œuvre, c'est au niveau de la société au complet. Euh, présentement, non seulement on a des changements au niveau du marché du travail, de l'automation, etc., dans les entreprises. Mais on a aussi des changements démographiques importants qui se, qui se produisent au Canada et ça pose des problèmes de fiscalité. De, parce que oui, il faut livrer des services, mais il faut aussi être capable de les payer. Alors, quand la nature du travail change, quand on a moins de travailleurs à temps plein, quand on a des travailleurs qui sont moins bien rémunérés, ça crée des enjeux pour l'ensemble du gouvernement. Excellent. Um, Francois was talking about sharing the challenges of, of people on the podium. Um, and by the way, probably about 60 to 70 percent of the room do understand French, so I don't want to, uh, and I'm obviously not a not a, an official interpreter. Uh, but the impacts that that are that are affecting Quebec in particular, obviously, huge demographic changes in Quebec right now. Um, less full time workers and more the precarious type of work that they're seeing uh, in Quebec at the, the present time as well. Alors, nos solutions pour euh, travailler sur ces enjeux-là doivent être globales. On, on travaille non pas dans des, de, de façon sectorielle, donc seulement un ministère, euh, par exemple, de la formation de la main dœuvre Il faut regarder, la, la, il faut approcher ces, ces problématiques-là de façon globale en travaillant sur la fiscalité. Comment retenir nos travailleurs âgés euh, plus longtemps sur la main dœuvre euh, sans leur causer des problèmes euh, financiers? Ou est-ce qu'ils vont payer en impôts tout ce qu'ils vont gagner? C'est un des enjeux importants et encore là, l'ensemble des gouvernements doivent collaborer parce que les politiques fiscales doivent être autant que possible harmonisées. Excellent. Um, and so in Quebec, they're really looking at it either sectorally and also, um, you know, working across government departments and looking specifically at, at specific groups as well. So what are the solutions for aging workers and how do you help to understand that across uh, different departments and how, how can it be an, an all of government approach through um, this issue, which is obviously very global? Peut-être un dernier point, uh, John. Uh, au Québec, ce qu'on a fait aussi dans les dernières années, c'est de reconnaître que des gens qui n'intégreront pas le marché du travail parce qu'ils ont des handicaps trop importants, qu'ils ont euh, différentes problématiques de vie qui euh, les empêchent euh, d'intégrer le marché du travail. Mais ces gens-là peuvent participer quand même à la société. Euh, et on, on tente de trouver des façons euh, par une espèce de programme de revenu minimum garanti, quoique ce n'est pas ça son nom, mais de donner une, une façon à ces personnes-là d'intégrer la société Pas seulement, souvent, on, on a tendance à, à se valoriser beaucoup par le travail, mais euh, juste de participer à la société, d'avoir une, une espèce de sécurité financière, de pouvoir sortir de chez soi, interagir, on peut contribuer à la société. Donc, c'est important, effectivement, d'avoir une vue globale. C'est pas seulement une vue de développement de la main d'œuvre, c'est une vue de développement euh, socio-économique global. So really important in Quebec that they're looking at how 
all can contribute to society. So there are those that are not able to be part of the workforce, and uh, whether they have certain disabilities or handicaps, and um, how they are able to integrate within society, contribute to the, the world of work, despite the fact that they not, might not be a formal participating uh, member. And so how can you look at you know, having a minimum guaranteed income and ensuring financial security so that even those people who are, are not able to contribute um, more officially to the world of work are actually really contributing to the betterment of Quebec society. Uh, Sarah, I'm just going to turn to you now. Um, at, at the Brookfield Institute, you've done a lot of work thinking about what happens in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, um, and a lot of work about what, uh, what's happening today. Can you paint a picture of the types of people who will struggle as work changes? I mean, we've heard a lot about Uber already today. We've heard a little bit about factory workers, maybe why we heard too much about factory workers. But how broad is this issue, and what does this messy middle actually look like, and how is it changing? Yeah, I think it's a good question, and I think the answer is that it has many faces, and those faces are going to continue to change. I think the, the first uh, point that's worth emphasizing is that it's a much broader group than we might traditionally have expected. Um, Middle-class jobs are uh, of increasing concern as uh, automation and offshoring uh, and other forms of restructuring, um, as we've seen with GM's decisions in Oshawa, uh, impact new groups of people uh, in new ways. I think the, the second point I would make, though, is that um, despite the fact that this is broad, it still does, um, these challenges are intersectional. So uh, groups that uh, face more complex barriers to, to work um, are, are likely to be the ones that are hit hardest by changes as they have been in the past and will continue to be in the future. Um, automation risk tends to concentrate uh, in jobs that have uh, lower wages associated with them. Um, people who have longer commute distances, who face language barriers, who may not have full access to computers and high-speed internet, uh, who have more restrictive work conditions or uh, parenting and child care or parent care responsibilities, depending on the case. Uh, these are all people that might find it more difficult to participate in training. Um, as, as you well know, uh, people who are working in the on-demand economy uh, and who may not qualify for EI uh, can also face difficulties in accessing training supports uh, and programs, uh, and employers may be less inclined to invest in them uh, than they would in full-time employees. Uh, there's also a time dimension to this. The longer people are out of the workforce, the harder it is for them to get back in. Um, and so, actually, the other point I would make, because this is a reality in Toronto and in a lot of our major cities right now, is that the cost of living is increasing in cities in particular. And so uh, people who may be lower income uh, will find it harder to manage periods of unemployment uh, and will find it harder to be financially sustainable during uh, periods of, of retraining. So I think we do need to be looking both broadly at groups that are being impacted across the income spectrum, across industries, across geographies, uh, but also recognizing the intersectionality of how these challenges are likely to play out in our population, uh, which is nothing new. Um, and then the, the last point I would make is that we, we over fixate on automation uh, and on job change and job loss, but as this panel uh, and this conference in general I think recognizes, uh, this is also about job quality. Um, and Sunil, you made the point that uh, there's a risk that we, as we focus on skills development and retraining and figuring out what skills might be in demand in the future, um, we might uh, forget that it's also important to ask what kind of jobs and what kind of economy we're asking people to train for. Um, if I can make a quick plug, there's a, a research project that the Brookfield Institute would really <laughs> love to take on, and we've been talking to both Sunil and John about this. Um, I, I think it's really... Uh, there's not enough that's known about the experience of people working in the on-demand economy in particular. Uh, it's not a new economy. Uh, on-demand work has existed for a long time, but digital platforms are changing the ways in which it's happening, potentially expanding uh, the number of people that are engaged in that part of the economy. And I don't think we know what that looks like or how, how it's evolving. Um, it's really important to look at how particular policies like EI might need to change to meet the needs of people working in this economy, but I think it's also really, it would be really helpful, and we would love to work on this with anybody in this audience who is interested, uh, to understand the experience of a range of different people in this economy, because for some it's, it's, it's wonderful and flexible, and for a lot of people it's also quite precarious. Um, and the, the barriers or the gaps that they're facing will transcend jurisdictional boundaries uh, and they'll transcend sectors. So we want to understand not just 
what EI needs to look like to help this group, but also what lending policies need to look like, what access to insurance uh, should look like, uh, et cetera. So anyone who wants to chat with me about that <laughs> after, please let well, me and, know. And you mentioned housing, where you often need a letter from your employer to get an yeah. apartment in Toronto. That's right. Um, uh, so these are these are important topics. Yeah. John has personal experience with that, generally. <laughs> well, yeah, that's why, yeah, yeah, well, we don't get to get into that. Um, <laughs> I just want to prompt the audience, uh, I'm supposed to prompt the audience, that uh, uh, there's a hashtag BWN2019 for Slido. Um, I'm hoping, oh, sorry, BNW2019 <laughs> for Slido. There's a whole other conference getting questions now that I mentioned before, uh, so they'll be surprised by that, I'm sure. Um, let, so let's move on to, to skills and training uh, for a minute. Uh, uh, Ethan, your report did spend uh, half of it talking about skills and training. Uh, this is a clear area of provincial jurisdiction here in Canada. Two of your main recommendations were, were around significant investment in community colleges uh, and around apprenticeships. Can you talk about why you focused on those two things? Certainly. Um, <clears throat> so you really want to make sure that when you are training that the, the training is high quality. And um, we found that uh, community colleges in particular, um, you know, community colleges in the United States are in you know, nearly you know, every, every, you know, they're in every single region. I think, it, I think they're actually in every single county in, um, in the country. And <clears throat> so they're very well placed to provide a lot of this, uh, a, a lot of this training, and, and, and you know, they oftentimes do. Um, there is um, a, a push also within a lot of states to, um, to create free college and free community college. Um, and that's one that I think we, we definitely are supportive of, uh, especially because we find that this type of training that community colleges are offering tends to be uh, a little more higher quality than some of the other training. So there's a whole, within kind of the skills training space, there's nonprofits, there's for-profits, the, it, it's, it's um, you know, the, the, obviously, uh, you know, community colleges is, is public, but there's also, of course, like a, um, you know, a lot on the private side, and there's just a like, huge amount of variation around what is good quality and what isn't. Um, so part of the challenge is, okay, we need to be investing more in the in the education, the, the training that we know is good quality. Um, part of the challenge is also how do we make sure that a lot of the other stuff that, that, that there's not a lot of predatory programs as well. And this this means having better da data on uh, outcomes of a lot of the programs, and then making sure that that. Uh, students are better able to to understand kind of here are actually my, my choices and this this may actually be you know I may actually be worse off so I mean, this is a concern about income sharing agreements or some of the new uh, uh, coding schools is that what you're talking about um, some of that I actually think that the, the income share agreements are a little less of a concern than some of the others because income share agreements you only really pay back if you are doing relatively well mm -hmm. um, there is still a concern there as well too um, but but that more broadly, I'm thinking more kind of like a lot of the the, the, the beauty schools that have been around for a long time. Um, there's, you know, you go to a lot of those, and you're actually worse off than you right. were before, um, right. both because of the opportunity cost, and then also you know, because of the the debt you take out or whatever. Um, so more generally, I think that we need to really make sure that there that there's high quality training, and that is also connected to jobs. And this gets to the the issue of apprenticeships. One of the great, you know, two really great things about apprenticeships. One is that you're paid while you're in it. So that alleviates some of the concerns around things like, you know, if you have caregiving responsibilities, transportation, that, that payment can, can help a little bit with that and make it a little more accessible to, to people, especially if they have a, um, other constraints. Um, but also, it connects directly to a job, too. Right. So, um, so you, you know that there is actually a career path. And that also means that it is more likely that the training that you're getting is then connected to, to your, that, that is actually an in-demand skill. Um, so it'll connect to a job now, but you know kind of like over time that that will also be a skill that will pay dividends too. So I think that, that also you know, looking at, at, at apprenticeship, I mean, it's also the case that a lot of people just don't do well with uh, classroom settings too. Right. Um, and that there's some ter certain types of skills that just don't translate well to the classroom. And so having more apprenticeships, I think, can be very helpful, um, not just in kind of getting, the, getting you know, people getting skills, but also in making sure that they are really injected back into the labor market in a very seamless way. Also, uh, apprenticeships is core to Quebec's strategy. Can you talk a little bit about, about your focus on that and what your other priorities are in post-secondary education? Oui. Uh, L'approche du Québec était vraiment, uh, ou est vraiment, de uh, répondre que l'éducation, la formation de main-d'oeuvre répondent concrètement aux besoins 
des secteurs industriels. Donc, nous avons déployé partout sur le territoire, dans chacune des 17 régions administratives, des conseils régionaux qui rassemblent des représentants des milieux de l'éducation, de la formation, euh, des entreprises euh, et euh, des travailleurs qui réfléchissent à l'offre de formation sur le territoire en lien avec les établissements d'éducation qui sont partout, donc les établissements publics. Donc, les enjeux de coûts au Québec sont peut-être moins importants que dans d'autres provinces euh, canadiennes ou certainement qu'aux États-Unis. Euh, mais euh, ça fait que l'enjeu de base, c'est que l'offre de formation, l'offre d'éducation puisse répondre et s'ajuster à ce que les gens sur le terrain perçoivent comme les enjeux présents et les défis à venir. Um, so in Quebec, they're focusing on uh, working with the industrial sectors. The people are actually on the ground in terms of better understanding the training is needed. So within the 17 administrative sectors of Quebec, they have regional councils that help respond and connect in with businesses to ensure that the training is what it needs to be, that it's practical, that it's needed. Um, also, uh, in working with uh, technical institutions, CEGEPs and universities, obviously the cost of post-secondary is dramatically less expensive, uh, definitely than the US, but also um, elsewhere in Canada as well. So it makes it much more accessible um, for people seeking further training. And uh, really the connection with the on-the-ground business um, is what makes the, uh, the Quebec experience a bit unique. Pour poursuivre oui. euh, très rapidement, donc on a euh, aussi des comités sectoriels de main d'œuvre, euh, des, des comités par secteur économique qui définissent vraiment de l'offre de formation avec les cégeps dans leur région. On parle de secteurs industriels variés, l'aérospatial, les mines. Donc, eux, c'est vraiment ce qu'ils vont voir, c'est que l'offre de formation pour les gens qui sont en emploi, mais aussi pour les jeunes qui sont en formation, qui vont intégrer leur marché du travail, soient vraiment adaptés à, à, aux besoins des entreprises. Et ces besoins-là évoluent très rapidement euh, présentement. Un dernier point, euh, c'est qu'avec les changements démographiques, la vitalité de l'économie euh, au Québec et dans plusieurs régions du Canada, les gens trouvent des emplois sans avoir nécessairement complété la formation. Ils entrent dans des entreprises mais ils ne sont pas pleinement formés. Et là, c'est euh, un des défis que nous avons, c'est de trouver comment euh, s'assurer que ces jeunes-là, euh, qui, qui, qui trouvent des très bons travaux euh, à 17-18 ans, vont continuer d'être formés pendant qu'ils travaillent pour ne pas se retrouver plus tard à, à être déclassés. Um... So all, working with the economic sectoral groups, um, you know, they have specific uh, uh, groups according to whether it's aerospatial or mining or the different sectors um, that focus not only for those starting out their career, but also mid-career and how the, the future of work, how everything is adapting and a need, need to change constantly. One of the issues that they're finding um, in Quebec and, and elsewhere in Canada as well is that um, Individuals are starting jobs uh, while they're doing training and often get hired before they're finishing their training. And so that's a big concern for the Quebec government. Um, how do we ensure that these people who are offered you know, lucrative positions young in their career actually finish their education and, um, and, and advance? Uh, because that's obviously a big concern if they're not uh, finishing their education because the offers are so good because of the, uh, the really tight job market. Merci, François. So, Sarah, a lot of, uh, some of that was about labor market information and one way to get labor market information. I know this is an issue that's close to your heart. And yours. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, which says very sad things, I think, about both of us. But anyway, <laughs> uh, um, if you could um, uh, talk a little bit about, because uh, you know, it feels like for a long time we've talked about what we need is better labor market information. And it feels like we're never any closer to achieving better labor market information. What's going on right now? What do you think needs to be done for us to be able to finally say, hey, look, We know what's going on, let's build around that. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting um, challenge that does keep rearing its head and not quite going away. I, I think our, our traditional labor market information has been useful for telling us about aggregate level trends, but has not been so useful at illuminating concrete pathways to job and training opportunities for people that may be uh, displaced by various labor market trends. There's growing interest in leveraging data in new ways to design new kinds of digital tools to better inform uh, decisions by job seekers um, or by learners uh, in navigating a changing labor market and to better support employers in identifying new sources of talent. 
uh, and program designers and policymakers and figuring out where they should be focusing their efforts. Um, some examples are the World Economic Forum working with burning glass uh, technologies, uh, Mars Data Catalyst working with Google uh, and recently with ourselves. RBC put out um, a report and a tool last year. Uh, the Labor Market Information Council is doing some interesting work in this area. We're not allowed to talk about RBC. <laughs> Sponsored by TV, just remember that. Right, sorry. <laughs> anyway, lots of people are, are tackling this problem in really interesting and important ways. Um, but I think there are probably four challenges, all of which I think we can overcome, but four challenges that are making this really, uh, um, really tricky. So the, the first is the nature of the data. Um, we need granular, real-time data in order to inform decision-making in a practical, useful way. Uh, and that means linking StatsCan data with non-traditional data sources, um, which may meet different standards um, of, of data quality. Uh, for, for instance, data that is web scraped from job ads that are posted online, um, data on job transitions from places like LinkedIn. Um, another challenge is, uh, is that this needs to be presented through digital tools that are really usable, user friendly. Um, so not, um, forgive me, uh, government people in the room, but not government labor market websites, which are notoriously impossible to navigate. Um, the, one of the thorniest challenges, and I think the most interesting one, is that I think this is going to require new forms of public-private partnerships. So we're, we're in an interesting time right now where there's growing public awareness and concern about uh, how, far, uh, how far behind policy frameworks are when it comes to uh, governing data use. Um, this has come up quite a bit in relation to the sidewalk uh, project in Toronto, um, but it's going to continue to come up in other domains. And so this is something that I think we need to be paying a lot of attention to in this space as well. Uh, a lot of these tools that are in development are proprietary in some way. Um, there's a lack of clarity on who owns the data and how that's going to be used, uh, how privacy is going to be governed. Um, and they're fragmented. Uh, and it's not obvious to governments, I think, um, what their role is in helping these tools achieve scale. Uh, so I think this is a really interesting challenge for us to tackle, um, and I think a really important one. Uh, I think there's a role for government both in opening up a market in which entrepreneurs can more readily leverage data to create digital tools for different use cases uh, in more interesting and effective ways. There's also a role for government in designing policy frameworks that, uh, that will shape how that happens uh, in ways that will, that will be more aligned with the public interest. Um, so challenging, but possible. If I can add one last thing. Please. I think this is a really critical part of the puzzle, but it's obviously not the only part. Uh, not everything can be solved through data. So if we're going to illuminate and activate pathways for, for people um, that are maybe facing job disruption to help them find opportunities for training or opportunities in higher growth areas of the economy, that's going to require a user-focused approach to designing training solutions. Uh, that will work for those people and that will work for employers. So we've been doing some work with the Mars Data Catalyst team that integrates kind of a data-driven quant approach with a more qualitative ethnographic approach to identify these high potential job transition pathways. And it certainly won't be perfect, but we're trying to start to build a framework that could be applied to different situations that looks not just at the skills similarity between jobs, which is important, and the credential requirements associated with destination jobs, but also at what signals employers tend to trust and ease of recruitment. Um, we're also interested in understanding what motivates a person to uh, move into a job or not. So identity can play into that. Wage expectations can play into that. Some people may be more or less willing to commute certain distances. So we're, we're trying to get a more human understanding of what makes a viable job transition pathway in practice. Thanks, Aaron. And that, it sounds like a lot of innovation you were just talking about. We're going to finish uh, quickly by talking word. about innovation. Uh, we're probably going to hear a lot about that today. We're going to hear a lot about the Future Skills Center today. And that's how the federal government is investing in research and experimentation to develop programs uh, to prepare the workforce for these skill changes that we're talking about. It seems like we're in a phase of history where uh, any change required is about innovation. And the only way to innovate is through an accelerator or an incubator. Um, my question, you've looked around the world at different things and uh, different ways that, that countries are adapting to the changing nature of work. Can you talk about, and I, and I, you know, I know you're somewhat conflicted here, but uh, um, because innovation is in the name of your uh, um, a firm, I fear that you can be objective here. What have you found that works? Have you seen any places that are really uh, thinking clearly about how to, affect, uh, how to uh, um, approach these changes? Yeah, so there's one example I'll, I'll mention. Uh, we did some case study work with Dan Bresnitz and Amos Sahavi from U of T last year. 
Uh, and we looked at a couple of different case studies. One was in North Carolina. Um, so traditional manufacturing was taking a nosedive over the last couple of decades. Uh, and at the same time, um, starting in the early 2000s, biopharma was growing and firms in the biopharma industry were struggling to find production line technicians. Uh, and that happened to correspond with some of the skill sets involved in the work that uh, the people were being laid off from. So produ production line workers in traditional manufacturing, about 200,000 people lost jobs between, I think, 96 and 2006 in the state. Uh, and so col colleges, a network of colleges in the state, um, industry and government got together to design something called BioWork in 2001. And this was, I think, a really interesting example that we can take a lot of lessons from that helped both firms source talent that was needed and also workers that were facing disruption navigate to a growth area of the economy. Um, so some of the, the important design features to, to point out, uh, it was designed with employers, so it resulted in a credential that employers trusted. Um, it uh, was a modular uh, short program that could be completed in a matter of weeks and it was designed flexibly to fit different learners' needs and different schedules. Um, and it was designed such that people without any university or college degree and without prior experience in the industry were eligible and could move through the program and into work on the other end. Um, and for all of those reasons, it was quite successful, uh, and in fact, it's gone through some different iterations and it still exists. I think what we can take away from that uh, for the Ontario and the Canadian context is the importance of multi-sector partnerships, not just in the implementation phase, but in the design phase. So I think employers need to be involved in designing training programs that will fit their needs uh, in order to make sure there's a job at the other end of that program. Uh, government needs to be involved um, because that also needs to work for the workers and, and governments have the public interest uh, at heart uh, and often with nonprofits as well who are involved in the training space. I think it's also important to note that it looked at uh, the underlying skills required to do the work, not at traditional credentials. And the last thing that I think is really important is that it was a custom built program for a particular opportunity. And you're not always gonna see that opportunity um, where you've got decline in one area that corresponds with the skills required for growth in another, but we should be much more deliberate about looking for those opportunities and looking for ways to activate those pathways. Uh, and I think traditional credential programs at universities and colleges and generic programs like Second Career just won't cut it. So I think building solutions that work is gonna require a very deliberate, focused, custom uh, effort. I'm seeing our time. Oh, I don't think that I don't think that's meant for us. Um, um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> to, to, to very quickly, even just in a, in a uh, uh, if you could highlight just a couple of states, she stole a state. I was expecting her to go international more broadly, but here she stayed close to home. So, uh, if you could give a couple of other states uh, that have done this well, and not go into de detail, but just identify some that we could look at. That I'll mention is uh, is Washington State. I think mentioned that earlier. There's actually um, uh, is a portal benefits bill that is in both Washington State, almost a, an almost identical bill is also in New Jersey, and I think has been also introduced in Georgia too. And this is a bill that would, for um, on-demand companies, would require them contribute to a kind of worker-owned uh, benefits fund. Right. Um, so that that's one. Another is also um, San Diego Workforce Board. Uh, so this is the so in, uh, in in the U.S. we have a uh, um, you know. Uh, uh, state uh, workforce boards and then local workforce boards. Uh, the local workforce boards have representation from business, educational institutions, uh, and, and, and government on it. It's kind of a quasi-governmental uh, entity uh, in this case. And what they've done recently is actually, to get back to a previous point about income share agreements, they have started a, an income share agreement um, for uh, putting work. So one of the challenges is that they, they have a lot of uh, um, uh, financial constraints that only about one in five of the people who uh, workers who are eligible for their training benefits can actually get those training benefits. So what they've done is they've, what they've partnered with UC um, San Diego um, Extension to do uh, a variety of different programs on uh, tech uh, credentials and using an income share agreement so that if uh, so the, the workers go into this program, and then if they make post-graduation make above a certain amount, then they're paying a certain percentage back into that fund. That fund then, of course, there's no profit. That fund then gets recycled to new students. So it's a renewable learning fund that is intended to actually be able to operate in perpetuity with only startup costs, which they covered through philanthropy. Thanks, Ethan. And I, I've been dying to ask this one question, so I'm going to I'm going to do this. Uh, Sunil, I'm going to give the last word to you. Uh, unlike Sarah, you don't need anyone out here to fund any more of your reports. Uh, well, so this is this is a you can I, I just can let it all be, out now. I can still be a consultant. Uh, 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 well, <laughs> well, uh, we'll forget you said that okay. and just ask you this: um, What one thing 
are you shocked that hasn't been done, where there just hasn't been political will to do one policy item that you think everyone should have done by now? Wow, that's a tough one to wrap up in 30 seconds. I mean, I, I would say- actually 10 seconds. 10 seconds. <laughs> I, I would say it's be bold. I mean, we need to work better together as governments in Canada. A lot of these issues are cross-jurisdictional. Uh, we kind of have to set aside the turf battles and focus on what are the problems we're facing and let's start rolling up our sleeves and addressing them. And we know that can be done. I mean, you look at countries like Denmark, they actually have to slow down their digital services because they're too quick. So for example, their divorce uh, online, people could get divorced instantaneously. They realized that wasn't a good idea if a couple <laughs> had a fight on a Friday night. They actually had to put a check in that this takes a few days so you can actually change your mind and say, you know what, maybe we don't need to get divorced over what, what show we were watching on Friday night. So it's possible to do government better, faster, um, and more intelligently, and we just need to kind of think holistically about how we start moving along uh, on that journey. And there is some good work being done in that front, but I think we just need to move faster and be bolder. Great, thanks so much, Daniel. And, and listen, if anyone knows of an organization uh, with a lot of provincial members who might consider doing a report like Ethan's around what provinces can do, what their agenda might be, uh, it'd be great if you could find that type of organization. Maybe we'll do one of those. Thanks, John. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much to our